All right. Uh, I didn't know who was going to be here when Greg asked me to talk, so I, I, I don't want to get too technical either. I didn't want to get too in-depth in philosophy and all this kind of stuff, and certainly no math or anything like that, because it would just look like hieroglyphics to most of us. And all the problems that he was talking about, philosophy, that, that is the most important problem in, in, in why science is broken. No question about it. But it's not the only problem. So I thought I'd lead us through and just, just briefly, very briefly, go through all of the things I think are plaguing science. And we can talk in more detail about the, the philosophical problems without trying to get too much in detail or in depth about those kind of two. So the main things that are broken about science, the expansion team effect, what I call the expansion team effect, and big money. And the more people there are in science, the more money there is, the greater the chance that things are going to go wrong somewhere. So the, the thing that follows after that is what I call the expertocracy which is uh, starting from the, it's not my idea, it's James Burnham's idea, it's, it's the managerial society where experts have come to rule in these bureaucratic fiefdoms and the like, and necessarily have come to rule, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But I think instead of managers so much anymore, we've, we've come up to these ideas of experts, and I'm going to discuss what I mean by that. And beneath that, uh, we start getting into more philosophical problems, is scientism and psychology. Scientism is the belief that all questions can be answered by science. Everything, good and bad, right and wrong, moral and immoral, all these kinds of things. And psychology is, of course, just the open worship of science. It's, it's partly sci uh, scientism itself, but more, more of the, the why we have activists plaguing, on, plaguing us on the streets and things like this. So the idea that everybody should go to school, everybody should have go to college, what's wrong with a little learning and all these kinds of things. And the, the problem is, uh, I like a stupid example. The, if, the more people you have in science is not necessarily the better. If you have a lot more people doing science, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have a lot more scientific results. And I'll give you a stupid example. Imagine you got the 10 smartest guys in the world. These are the 10 smartest guys. And these guys, uh, we're, gonna call, we're gonna make them all scientists. And their output, we're just going to call science, just for the sake of thing. Now, the intelligence, the average intelligence of science, or the scientific output, of course, is going to be as high as it can possibly be. These are the 10 smartest guys in the world. But now imagine you called everybody. Everybody is now a scientist. Of course, this is what we are. We, we could all be scientists. We could all be geniuses now. Now, I, I just necessarily, just a simple mathematical proof, the average intelligence of what we now call science is, of course, plummeted. So that's a problem. So it's a problem when we try to take, make everybody, everybody in, in, uh, go through this educational process and everything. And we, we were warned about this often. Uh, there's the, uh, the idea of the problem of the overproduction of elites. We have too many people who believe themselves better than they are because they've been given a certificate that says they are. And we become like the scarecrow in the movie The Wizard of Oz. You remember that? He's a humble and self-effacing character. Until the very end, he's given a diploma, and he immediately starts spouting uh, mathematics, <laughs> authoritatively <laughs> and wrongly. The equation he gave is wrong. It's just wrong. I'm not going to go into it, but it's false. <laughs> However, that, that'll, that'll lead us into our experts. And so Cardinal Richelieu, he, he wrote a thin book that most people don't know about. Well, I, I guess it's more of a pamphlet, but a book on education. He said that if learning were profaned, profaned his word, by being made available to all and sundry, it will become, uh, we, we, will, we will discover more people able to create doubts than of resolving them. And it will be find, we'll find more people apt at uh, questioning truth than in defending it. And I think we've seen this kind of a thing where we want to make everybody everybody part of the system. And not only that, even if you think, well, okay, maybe it's, we can't just have 10 guys doing science. That's not enough. We need, to have, we need to have some more. And it's true. We need to have some more. But the greater it grows, uh, the more science becomes a bureaucracy. And the more time scientists have to spend participating in the bureaucracy rather than thinking. And that's a problem. We have journals. Journals, uh, the number of journals uh, has exploded. I don't know, it just goes up by order, it just goes up exponentially, a real exponential curve. And it's, it's just thousands and thousands of journals with more appearing all the time. And the number of papers, it, nobody knows. It just goes up, nobody can read them all. 
It's impossible to read them all, but because of peer review and everything, your time is sucked away reading these things that nobody cares about, but are absolutely necessary because of the rituals of science. You, it really is in academics, publish or perish. If you don't do that, you will perish. So all this is true. So I, I think, Jay can tell me, I think the, most people say the, the average time between now is like 40 to 50 to 60 percent people spend on writing grants just in that bureaucracy process trying to do it because science has become so big. And Eisenhower, of course, uh, warned, famously warned about this in his farewell speech. I think most people have probably heard this before. He said the scientific technocratic elite that could develop, that he saw coming, was gravely to be uh, uh, regarded. Yes, thank you. Yes, and that's exactly right. That's the, that's the, that's the quote. And he, he, met, he was lamenting this, the, the, the disappearance of the small-time sort of bench scientist uh, that's really now almost completely gone, and now we have nothing but giant bureaucracies. So that leads us into this availability, this great pool of availability of scientists for now where the ability range is all over the map, allows the expertocracy to sort of come into being. Now, what's the expertocracy? Well, of course, when Burnham and, and Sam Francis and others were writing, about the, uh, were writing about the managerial revolution, the managerial society, and they were right about this, the idea was, well, capitalists had control of their own money and the means of production and all this kind of stuff, but technology was increasing so much and society was increasing in complexity so much. They, the owners themselves, could not really run the business as efficiently as they would have liked to, and so they had to hire professional managers. And the managers, their term for it, took over, took over. And that's kind of what we see in the bureaucracies of the world. And that was the FDR, for instance, he famously or infamously, depending on your position, uh, staffed government and created government agencies in just this way to be run by experts. And it doesn't sound like a terrible idea at first. Why wouldn't we want to have people who are good at these particular tasks in charge? We want to have experts in there. Nobody saw how that could metastasize, but it has with uh, the creation of experts. Because what we have is a ruling class, and they have solutions. Solutions. I'm going to use quote, uh, the, the scare quotes. That's what David Stobe told us about brilliantly, scare quotes. They have solutions in search of problems. In other words, they have things they want to implement, things they want to get done things they want to push over on us, and they need to have scientific support for these ideas. And so what they do is they go to the tremendous pool of scientists that we have, and they find somebody in here who's willing to give them the support that they need for their solutions. And that person or persons suddenly become experts. So an expert is not just somebody who has expertise or credentials or something like that. An expert, in my opinion, in my terminology, as somebody who does have expertise, uh, maybe not great expertise, but somebody who is willing to provide the, the ruling, uh, our ruling class with the support that they need. And now what happens is these people become promoted, they're given the best grants, and what happens, probably everybody knows this here, but these same people go in and out of government in and out of the government granting agencies, even if they're at universities and things like this, it's all one big sort of happy family. And this is why we see the people saying, uh, they say, follow the science. They don't say follow science. That's very different. They say follow the science. And that tells you right there something's going on. We're back to that consensus here. We have a consensus. Well, that necessarily kills any future science. These experts have created these, these uh, cabals, really, of these beliefs, the consensus, which naturally accord with what governments want to do. And that's very suspicious. Uh, it, it should not be driven in that way. And that's why we have, uh, this is why if people like myself, people like Jay, others who have been canceled in here, or one way or another, uh, they say, you're a denier. You're denying, how can you, what are you denying? I'm denying, yes, I am denying. I'm saying what you're saying is wrong. You're, <laughs> yes, I am. But you're a denier. This is, this is more of a, this, this is not scientific. Okay, so this is what the expertocracy has become. become. Uh, I, you know, we can all think, there, I got a million examples of each of these things, but I don't want to dwell on every one of them because I think most of us have seen all these kinds of things. And, and all of these things apply not just to medicine, but they apply to 
global warming of doom. They applied, of course, to the COVID panic. Uh, the, the, the government created a co corona panic. They probably created the bug itself in one way or another and then botched and mismanaged uh, the, the solutions that they had for it all along. And we saw it there, but it's, it happens everywhere. It happens in every branch of stuff, and not just science, but everywhere. So, and the same thing with the woke and die, the same thing with the expansion team and the money effect. These things are not unique to science in any way. But the reason uh, the, the ruling class looked to scientists is because of scientism. They all believe that you have to have uh, scientific support for their, for their solutions. So we never debated in all this kind of stuff. There was, there was an attempt, uh, Jay can tell you about this more, because I, 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 I've known Jay on, online anyway for some, I don't know where he is. In the back over there, yes. The Great Barrington Declaration, for instance. This is an example of people trying to have a debate about what's the right thing to do, right versus wrong. Now that's not a scientific question. Science can help answer, uh, what if I do this? Is it gonna be more of this or more of this or more of that, or whatever. But that what to do is never a scientific question. What to do, what is right and wrong to do, these are moral questions. These are questions that science can't answer. But everybody comes to believe that science is the only way of knowing. And then we end, with people like, uh, we end up with people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, the celebrity scientist himself who says, his famous quote, I'm gonna botch it a little bit, but he says, the, thing that, the nice thing about science is, is it's true whether or not you believe it. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean exactly? It doesn't mean it. Listen, they, they often boast science is self-correcting. You've heard that a million times, right? Oh, so, so, why do we believe science? Because science is self-correcting. Is that so? Then maybe you're wrong right now because I can only self-correct something that is wrong. How do I know you're right right now? And those kind of questions just get dissolved. And the cytolatry aspect is why we have these, and I'm using this term in the nicest possible technical way. We have these ignorant little children <laughs> foisted upon uh, the UN, lecturing people about a subject of thermodynamics of fluid flow on a rotating sphere. Now, this kid can't possibly know anything about this subject. I know something about this subject. I might be wrong. Everybody could be wrong. But I like to call this the appeal to non-authority. It's very popular in our <laughs> culture. The appeal to authority, we've all heard, but the appeal to non-authority, that's a good one. All right, that's uh, scientism and cytolatry. Now, uh, oh, yes, it's, 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 it's also a philosophical problem. It's also a philosophical problem because it's obviously false. All questions cannot be answered by science. Science, which none of us have defined yet, is really just trying to discover the cause of things we can observe. That's it. It's not, nothing fancy. It's nothing unique. Uh, it's nothing unique in, in human history or human uh, intellectual thought. Science is, is not something that uh, is different in any way. There's no, the famed scientific method we find in every field uh, that cares to, to learn something. So there's nothing special about this. We just happen to live in a time where there was great scientific progress. We discovered the cause of a lot of things over the past century, but pro science is more or less stalled and gone through a lot of dead ends, not just because of the political reasons, but because we come now to the philosophical aspects. These are the most difficult things to talk about, and I don't, I don't want to bore us with getting into a lot of uh, fine detail on all these kind of things. But basically the story, is, as Greg was telling us, it's, and it started way back, it started way back in the Middle Ages with this idea of nominalism as opposed to realism. Uh, the idea of realism, of course, is the, just exactly what you think it is. There's a real world out there, and we can know it imperfectly, you know, incompletely, but it's there, and we can know it. We can do our best effort to find it. Nominalism is something different. It's, it sort of says, not really, uh, and it, it says everything, there, there is no real essence of anything. There are no real things. Everything is just kind of a, a thing in our minds, uh, it, putting it in a, in a, in a really brief way. Well. With, I'm not going to lead us through the whole story, but all that did eventually lead to David Hume and skepticism. David Hume was, of course, infamously skeptical about cause. We can never know cause. Induction is irrational. That's why Stove's book, The Rationality of Induction. So, and of course, uh, he had thought, uh, many people still think, and many people come from Hume, Popper is a direct uh, intellectual descendant 
of, of David Hume. And a lot of scientific methods are direct descendants of, of this uh, Humean, Popperian skepticism, which I'll talk about a little bit now. So that skepticism is one thing. And the other side, the realist side, it's kind of funny, but, uh, and uh, Greg kind of told you, but maybe it wasn't emphasized too much here, is that the realist side has always been physicists. All the people, Laplace, physics, and he, of course, and, but he also gave us a very wonderful book on probability that most people don't know about. It's, Dover still has copies of it in print. Popper, and then E.T. James, of course, was a physicist. And his work, what uh, Greg also didn't tell you, his work, it's not well accepted in physics. There's a small group in physics that sort of followed him after his death. This book was posthumously published. There was chapters he had been writing, and, and they were available, uh, and we were not encouraged to read them. This is when I was a graduate student back at Cornell. In Samizad, he would publish down at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and put these things out in his students' Larry Brettenhorst and others would sort of uh, filter them along to people to read. And so this book, as wonderful it is, as it is, is not that well known yet, uh, outside thing. And, and really, this is one of the problems we have. So all this kind of stuff we've been talking about. So I have a PhD. I, my, I started off doing uh, uh, meteorology. My bachelor's is in meteorology. And why? Because I got out of the Air Force and global warming had just started to be a thing back then. And I believed it. I thought it was real. It sounded plausible. And I became very interested in how these models worked, the global warming models, uh, because after all, that's how we say we know what's going on. And I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to bore us about global warming too much, but I want to talk about models. So I became very interested in models. What makes a good one? What makes a bad one? How are they useful? What, what, what does a model mean? So I switched over into doing uh, statistics and mathematics entirely. And that's when I discovered these models, the global warming models, stink. They, 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 really, they are poor. They're extremely poor at making predictions. They do not make good predictions. And I discovered that, and that was my, led to my first cancellation. But I, that, <laughs> <coughs> but I discovered, listen, I went through this whole period. I went through the, and, and all scientists are like that. You, you hardly ever... In any place you go to get your PhD in, in sciences, from any of the major universities, mine's from Cornell, which at one time was considered a good university, maybe not so much anymore. You don't have to take any philosophy. You don't have to read any philosophy. You don't have to, you don't have to understand any of these things. So scientists, when they, when they have a philosophy, a lot of scientists say philosophy is complete nonsense. Philosophy is useless to them, which of course is a philosophy. Uh, so they don't know they have a philosophy, so they have it kind of piecemeal. And they say metaphysics. Well, Popper taught us we don't need metaphysics. The empiricists, the logical positivists, and so forth, taught us we don't even need really metaphysics. And so if you don't understand metaphysics, then you don't understand what nature is. And so how can you go out and discover what nature really does? And so we come into a lot of blind alleys. So all of this stuff is extremely necessary, but none of it is taught. You have to teach yourself. You can't find this stuff out. Even today, these, these wonderful books, even today, they're not being taught anywhere. I made an attempt to teach them myself at a visiting professor, and I was told, you know, Matt, uh, maybe this stuff is a little too... No. Can't be done. You can't do it. You have to go through these standard litanies for all those other reasons. Well, that, that's the problem with the expansion team effect we didn't talk about. But everything sort of becomes siloed and, and bureaucratized. Everything becomes very ritualized and formalized, which everybody knows. All right. So uh, the, the, the skepticism, and I'm only going to talk, we can go on and on about this all day long. But there's, there, there's only two areas I want to talk. If anybody's got questions. Yeah. I'd just love for you to finish up to to what? What, did, what, what? what words did they put to that? To what that you were going to extend and teach in that um, uh, class? Oh, we, we don't do that sort of thing here like that. I don't remember the exact words. Yeah, I don't remember the exact words. I was not, uh, actively discouraged. <laughs> I wrote, a little, I wrote a little textbook to give away free. I gave it away free to the kids. The, uh, the breaking the law of averages, the kind of like a, just for the, the 101 kids, it's so, that, so that they could have something to try to back it up. Because they, but uh, it wasn't really allowed. Yeah, so, and th so I didn't charge for it because I didn't want them to get in any kind of trouble. Anyway, uh, what was my point? So there's two things. That there's that sort of Popperian uh, skepticism. And, 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 and then that led to a misunderstanding 
about what models are. Now this is, the, this, this is where it starts to get really hard. All this other stuff we've had a lot of day-to-day -day familiar, familiarity with, but this other, the, the, these ideas of skepticism and so forth, we don't. So uh, I'll talk just a little bit about statistics and I can talk about physics and medicine uh, and how, the, how it's applied in physics and medicine. So Popper had the idea. He said, it's never rational to believe a theory. It's only rational to disbelieve it or disprove a theory, and out of which came this idea of falsifiability. Have you heard of that? So he said, scientific theories are only scientific because they're falsifiable. And so uh, this is silly because nobody ever, uh, this is, nobody ever falsified. It, it's true. If you prove a model false, you should not use it. Absolutely. But nobody ever really proves a model false in a way that's convincing. I mean, if you take it, you take like, uh, uh, I like to use like a dowser or something like this, you know, the guys with the dowsing rods and things like this. They, they, sometimes they put them to the test, a rigorous test. They run pipes underground and things like this where they know they are, where the experimenters know where they are, but the, the dowser does not, or it has to try to find them using his technique. And invariably the dowser fails, but there's always reasons for the failure. The, the, the water lines were crossed, it was too hot, the sun's rays obscured. The, there's always a reason nobody ever disbelieves in the theory that they have. And the same thing with the global warming models, with the corona doom models that we've seen. Nobody disbelieves because the model has been proven wrong. That's, it just doesn't happen that way. It's more a matter of about power than anything else. So the falsifiability is just wrong. But it convinced uh, a guy named Fisher, who was a geneticist, and himself a probabilist, to think about how can he build this into science? How can he build this idea of falsifiability into science? So he was the inventor of this thing called a p-value. So have you guys heard of this p-value thing before? <laughs> Who can tell me the definition of a p-value? Seriously, if you've seen it and heard about it and read it in statistical literature, I'm not gonna ask, you, you're, you, you've seen me a million times. It's a threshold for determining whether something is Chance versus likely true. Okay. It's kind of a, a divider threshold. Of Better guess? That's wrong. <laughs> no, dear. <deal. laughs> it's a measure of a particular set of parameters of the data that you have on the null hypothesis and whether or not that null hypothesis in an imaginary world where that null hypothesis is true and that experiment was rerun an infinite number of times. Oh, he's repeating me. <laughs> if there's uh, the, the p-value is a measure of your likelihood of seeing those same results if that null hypothesis. That's close. That's close. It's none of these things. It's none of these things. Really, really, it's an obscure nonsense measure, is what it is. It, it's an idea that it, it absolutely does nothing for you. Everybody takes it to mean, like you said, oh, that means the the, the results that I have are. What does due to chance mean? Due to chance. This is a philosophical problem. What does due to chance mean? That must mean if it's something is due to chance, chance is a causative agent. What is this chance? Chance is a power? Chance can't be a power. Chance is just means probability, randomness. Random just, just means unknown. This, this is like logic, just a matter of mind. So nothing can be due to chance. What it can mean is something is Something other than what I think has caused the result has caused the result. But that's not even what p-values do. P-values try to build this idea of falsifiability into, into statistics, which is why we see so much enormous number of mistaken papers published. So what happened in all of science, not just in at peop, the, uh, papers that use statistics, but even in physics, what became, what became the criterion for good science versus bad science was how well a model fit the data. How well models fit data? How well the model fits it? If the model fits the data well, that's a good model. And so papers galore are published using this. So p-values help people to, yeah, my model fits that data well. So therefore, my model is, is, is worthy and I can publish this. And so, it, but it happens in physics too. It happens in chemistry. It happens in every field. Model fit became the sole criterion. But it's nonsense. And I'm going to try to explain why, and it's very difficult. Now, a model is not just, you know, you can write down an equation, y equals x1 plus x2, that kind of a thing. That's the mathematical part of these models, okay? That part, that's part of the model. But that's not the only thing. 
What's never written down in these models is the enormous number of premises or propositions that accompany that equation. So if you're taking data, that data becomes some of your premises, but that data, not just the data itself, but how the data was taken, where the data was taken, when it was taken, what was it taken on, and what everything that was affecting the, 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 either the people or the things that you were measuring. There's actually a huge, almost, it's not infinite, but it's very large number of, uh, of, of implicit premises that are in every single model. And so when you find that something that fits then you say, here's my model, and it fits well, and you publish these things, and, it, and they become a famous paper, and everybody's cite, citing you and all this kind of stuff, and then somebody comes back later and says, okay, I'm gonna try to redo this, this is such a famous paper, and they've done this many times now, uh, in, in e economics and psychology and elsewhere, and they discover, wait a minute, I can't get my, that same model that this guy used, and I took new data, why doesn't it fit? The fit's gone because they thought that the model only was these little bits of math that they wrote out and they forgot all of those implicit premises. Because, and I'm not gonna prove this to you, because you could always find a model, always, absolutely always, to fit any set of data that you have to any level of goodness you want. Always, absolutely always. So you could always publish something that says, here's some, this model I have that fits this set of data well. But, it doesn't work. So how can we tell if a model works? Well, now we're right back to where we started. The only way we can tell that model works is if it makes good predictions. And predictions of, of data, if you like, or predictions of things that we've never seen uh, or used in any way to build that model. So if we've, if we've used the same data to fit the model and test the model, we're not doing anything except saying, here's how well the model fit. And, and we could always do that. In fact, if you have a set of data and you can't find a model that fits that data to arbitrary precision, you're just not working hard enough. You can do this always, without exception. It's just, yes, sir? I don't say that's the only thing that matters. I, I'm gonna, absolutely, that's gonna be, that was gonna be my stunning <laughs> close. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's absolutely. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll just jump into it. So, but if I have a model, if I have a model that fits this, this, this data, that's all I'm gonna release to the world is just how well this model fit. Don't trust it. But if I have a model and I say, here's the predictions it makes, if, if, these conditions hold, here's what you should see. Go out and look. Now you can go out and verify that to yourself. But here's the thing. Even if that comes back good, even if I've got a, a model that has good predictions, that doesn't necessarily explain cause. It doesn't necessarily explain cause at all. You haven't necessarily learned what's going on with nature. Absolutely. So cause, we come right back to cause. We come back to the thing that people are most skeptical about. Uh, Popper was skeptical about the nature of cause, said cause couldn't be known. And Bertrand Russell was skeptical about the nature of cause, said cause couldn't be known. Fisher in his thing says cause couldn't be known. So we have all these weird, we have all these weird euphemisms that have risen up like linked with, linked. You'll see, you know, eating chocolate linked to heart disease, linked. What does that mean? What does it mean exactly? Does it, does it cause heart disease? Well, yeah, that's what they want you to believe. No, because I haven't proven it, because all I've said was my model about this fits real well. And I, I've probably talked long enough, but I can give more examples about this. But, so I'll give you the, the one last example is uh, my favorite uh, from this website called Spurious Correlations. It, you can look it up, it's a very it's a fun website. This guy just does all kind of correlations, correlations that are spurious. Now how do we know they're spurious? That's the, that's the thing. So my favorite one of all these is a graph of US spending on science and the number of people who die strangling themselves <laughs> in bed with their bed sheets. This happens. You think I'm gonna do that? I don't know, you look like the type. <laughs> and the correlation, the model between these two. If we do a p-value, it'd be as, you have this spectacle of some scientist running around saying, oh, look at my wee p-value, look at my wee p-value, waving it around, no. <laughs> that model though, I tell you, would make a good prediction. 
And why? Because the number of people who are killing themselves in their beds is increasing because population's increasing. U.S. spending is going up because U.S. spending is going up. So that model would make good predictions. But of course, if the causative link, you know, government spending linked to strength, bed strangulations is absurd <laughs> because we don't understand cause. In this case, we do understand cause. So we, we really need to get back to these uh, very old ideas of cause, not just cause in the efficient causal sense where the, the power, the motive force behind something, but cause in its full form, cause of its, it, its form, the formal cause, the, the material cause, the efficient cause, the, the final cause, the te teleological cause. Teleology has sort of been banished from science, modern science. So getting into that kind of subject, that could take a, an entire lecture I'm not going to get into, but I think you get the idea. And I can give you many more afterwards, but that's pretty much it. So we, we, we solve the politics, which is not going to happen anytime soon. So I think, what, 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 what do we do? All right, well, nothing. I don't think we can do much about this. We're not going to really solve the politics. Scientism is a, a, a cultural, a huge cultural difficulty. How do we get people talking about what is good, what is the good life, all that kind of stuff? We need to have that kind of, uh, find a way to get people back to that. And the philosophical problems, we might make some headroom on them, uh, but only at this level, only at this level. At the institutional level, I don't think we're going to make much headway in this political climate. And that's all I have, and thank you very much.